is the electronic version of these file folders. So now that manual process has been completely automated within one site. All of your lease paperwork will now be instantly gathered, created, and waiting for you within one site the very moment that you need it. During your custom packet implementation, your consultant would have built you three custom packets, each one being tied to a process within one site that requires lease paperwork. Those three main packets being your move-in packet, which is going to be connected to your move-in process within one site and will store all of your move-in lease paperwork and itemize storage space for the items that you collect during that move-in process. A renewal packet would have been created for you as well, which will store all of your renewal lease paperwork for your current residents during that renewal process. And finally, a midterm packet. Now this one most likely sounds the least familiar to all of you, but it is exactly as that name implies and will cover all lease paperwork for any changes that occur mid-term or mid-lease. Now we will be covering some very important topics in this lengthy class. So to help reinforce this knowledge, we will be having some friendly competition happening throughout. I will be launching pop quizzes for you all throughout the training. You will answer and raise your hand using that raise hand icon that we located earlier. The first person to answer correctly gets that point for that quiz. And the person with the most points by the end of the call will win. To get familiar with what to expect, I'm going to launch a test quiz for you all right now. Good afternoon, greetings, and salutations. Uh, welcome to Custom Packets. I am Janelle. I'm the scorekeeper today. I'm here to just kind of keep things going in the right direction, answer your chats if you have any questions in the chat, or uh, you can also use the Q&A button to, to get in contact with me. Um, now, like Jennifer said, um, you know, we're going to be launching a few different, uh, you know, short quizzes just to kind of keep the energy peaked. Here is our first quiz. This is only a test quiz just to make sure that I can see you and you can hear and see me. Um, once you answer the question, if you would, please be sure to uh, click on the raise your hand icon, okay? All right. So I do see you, M.O. Or is it Mo? I don't, I don't know for sure, but, you know, welcome to, to Custom Packets. OK, so, you know, the question was, why did the chicken cross the road? Sometimes I get answers, well, it's an optical illusion. And Mo says, I don't know. <laughs> but for most of us, it's to get to the other side. And that's what we're trying to do today. We're going to start at the beginning with packets and we're going to, you know, get to the other side. You guys will know how to countersign and do all kinds of good stuff before this is all over. OK, um, so, you know, if you would just, you know, be patient with us. We're going to, you know, have a, a good time in class today and let's generate some packets. So let's go ahead and get things started off from our today page view within OneSite. If you guys have used OneSite for any period of time, I'm sure you already understand the importance of this today page view. As you guys are required to do a million things on your daily, weekly, monthly basis, and you're able to complete a lot of those required tasks, with the aids of what we call snapshots that can be added to your today page view. And your custom packets will be no different in the regard that they too will have certain snapshots that we highly suggest that you add to your today page after you get off the line with me today. 
So if you guys have the ability to customize your Today page, you should see this Customize button to the top right-hand side of your screen. This is an ability that is added to certain rights and roles within one site. So if for any reason you do not see this button, I would advise that you consult with your super user for your company to have that right added to your current role. So I'm going to select my customize and all of my current snapshots become available for me to adjust, whether that be simply adjusting them on my screen, adding to what I currently see, or even removing those that I currently have access to. Typically, you guys would simply add to what you're using today. But for my training purposes, and to make sure no one gets distracted the way that I do, I'm going to remove everything that does not relate to your custom packets. Once starting with a clean slate, we're going to go to the pull down on this left hand side, and we're going to select the document management category. And we will see that there are several snapshots actually available here but only two are specifically tied to your custom packets as a whole. And they're pretty easy to spot as they are the only two that actually say packet in its title. Now the most important one out of the two that we're gonna add is gonna be that first one that says packet leasing summary snapshot. And when we grab this one and drag it over to our today page view, you're gonna notice that it is very large. It's gonna take up a lot of space on your Today page. But it's for good reason. This one snapshot is gonna house all of your packets and you'll be able to maintain each of those packets all the way from their creation to their close. So this one view is like a one-stop shop. Now, in addition to this packet leasing summary, we're also going to grab this much smaller, but still very helpful packets snapshot. Now this little guy is going to serve as our electronic filing cabinet, as all of our completed packets will end up filing themselves away if we've done all of our steps correctly. So we can also think of it as a finishing line. But once both have been added, we're going to go down to the bottom and select Save for our current Today page to update with that change. Now remember that this packet leasing summary houses every packet for every process that you have at your communities. So that would be that move-in packet, that renewal packet, midterm packets, and any additional packets that your community may have. You can toggle between any of those packet types from this top pull down under packet type. Now every packet can live within three statuses in its overall lifespan. And its starting status is pending. Pending packet status means that there are still required action items within that packet or file folder that must be completed before the process that the packet is tied to can be completed within one site. So as an example here, if we are in pending packet status for a move-in packet, what that is telling us is that any name that we see listed, we are going to be physically unable to move into one site because we have not completed the necessary paperwork to do so. Now, once all requirements within that packet or file folder have been completed, the packet will then move from pending status down to completed. Now, completed packet status means that you have completed all the necessary paperwork, but this time you haven't completed the process. So you haven't physically gone in and moved that person into one site or you haven't physically renewed that person within one site. So once both packet and process have been completed, the packet will then move from completed packet status and will file itself away for us into our packet snapshot under closed status. And that process is completely automated if we've done everything correctly. So we're going to move from 
pending down to completed and completed down to closed. Now, most of our packets are also very intuitive and they'll know exactly when you need them. And what we call this is auto generation. Packets can auto generate when they're tied to a specific trigger action within one site. And our move in packet is one of those that has a specific trigger action. That trigger is when there is a new applicant entered into one site. Once the prospect has changed to applicant status instantly now, a move-in packet will be created and stored here on your Today page for easy access. So we're assuming that you guys work for some pretty great companies and they give you a few days off here or there. So let's assume that you were out of the office yesterday and you come into the office today now having access to these new snapshots. You can see that while you are out of the office, you've gotten a new lease. And you can see everything you need to know about this new lease and the necessary paperwork that's going to have to be completed. So starting from the left hand side and working my way all the way to the right hand side, I can see what unit number this person has recently applied for. I can see their name. And you're going to notice that their name is a blue hyperlink, what we call a quick access tab. If I were to click on this at any point, it will instantly take me to that person's resident or applicants at a glance page. Under leasing status, I can see that they are an applicant. And under packet name, I see another blue hyperlink. Now this quick access tab is your actual custom packet or the file folder where all of your lease paperwork will be waiting for you. A little further down, I can see what day they applied and what day they plan to move in. Now, if I were to cut this tracker in half, this left hand side of the tracker is just the informational piece. So helping me get to know who it is I'm working with. But the right hand side of the tracker is what we call our progress piece. As the right hand side has several numeric columns that help us understand what has already happened in the packet, what is remaining within the packet, and how long we have to complete what's within that packet. So starting on that right hand side, we have what we call our day counters. And it's pretty easy to see why I call it that, as they are the only thing on the entire snapshot that says days. And they are both designed to give you a physical countdown of how many days you have before a certain packet comes due. Now the first day counter that we see says days until offer expires. And for a move in packet is going to reflect zero and can be ignored. This is because this day counter is counting to when a renewal offer is going to expire. With this being a move in packet, a renewal offer is not yet generated, which makes that column invalid. But the second day counter, that days remaining before packet due, is extremely important for us for a move in packet. As this day counter gives us a physical countdown from the system date to their move in date. So we know exactly how many days we have to complete all of the requirements within that packet so that we can successfully move that person in when it's time. So for Johnny, I see that I have two days from today's date to when he plans to move in. And now that I know my time frame, I need to know how many requirements I have to complete within that time frame. And I can learn that from the very next column under required documents. Now this number will vary depending on the packet type that you're working on, the packet build that you did, or even the person that you're working on. But whatever number you see here, and in our case, this number eight, that's telling you exactly how many requirements overall need to be completed within that packet so that you can move that person in or renew that person. So if I knew nothing about Johnny, 
let's say he leased by himself and I'm just coming in and noticing him on my today page snapshot, I can gain all of the information within seconds. Knowing that I'm going to have eight requirements to complete within two days before he plans to move in on July 1st. Now behind our required documents section, we are going to have four additional columns here. And I call these the back four, as they are your last four numeric columns. Now your back four is going to tell you what has already happened in this packet to date. And with four big zeros here, that's a pretty clear indicator that nothing's been done to this packet yet. Not by resident and not by management. And with only two days to get all of this work done, that would be my top priority. Now, if Johnny had truly applied online, again, assuming you guys have the online leasing program within one site, then you may see your back four numbers skew just slightly. And that is because the online leasing program does communicate to your custom packets on your behalf. Assuming that Johnny completed the online application online, then that online leasing application would flow into the packet and instantly store itself waiting for your review and approval. If he uploaded his own proof of income or a photo ID, those items too would flow into the packet and wait for your approval. So you may see these back four numbers skew just slightly. But as best practice, if your back four numbers are low in comparison to your required documents number, you would want to treat it as if it's a brand new packet. And from there, you would start your packet process steps. Now your packet process steps are going to stay identical no matter what packet that you're working on. And when we jump into this particular packet, we are going to go in great detail. But before we do just that, let's go ahead and launch our very first pop quiz, starting now. Wasn't that bad? That was an okay segment right there. Um, that was um, on the Today page and it's snapshots. Uh, welcome, uh, Nisha TC, um, to our training class. Um, I know that you might not, didn't catch the entire segment, but you know, if you would, take the quiz with us anyway, and because we will be going over the answers. Now, for this quiz, I would like to award two points to the first person who answers all questions and presses the raise their hand icon at the end, just so I can see it, okay? So here comes our quiz on the Today page. Nice job, Mo. Mo was on the board with two points. Woo woo. <laughs> okay, I'm just give give a few more moments for Nisha so we can get her answers in here too. All right. All right, guys. Well, let's see what kind of answers we have, okay, on our Today Page quiz. Question number one. What are the two snapshots that should be added to your Today Page for custom packets? That one is going to be the packet leasing summary. That's the one that has the front four and the back four. Um, it takes up the entire width of the page. 
Um, and then there's the, the packet snapshot. That's the little bitty one. We consider that one to be our um, electronic filing cabinet, okay? And we'll, we'll get back into that a little bit later. Question number two, when will a new move-in packet be created and stored on your Today page? And that's when a new applicant is entered into one site. So whether it be a person who applies online and they, you know, do everything through the internet, or it could be a person who comes into the office, sits down at the desk and, you know, fills out their uh, application right there and you guys entered into one site. But the moment that a prospect becomes an applicant in one site, that is what triggers the packet, okay? Question number three. What does days remaining before packet do tell us for move-in packets? And that is exactly right. It, it's, that's how many days are left to complete all requirements in the packet. Yeah. All right, guys, we are rocking and rolling. Now, I do want to give you a heads up on this next segment. This next segment is going to be on the move-in packet. It is a really beefy segment. I'm not going to lie to you. Make it seem like it's quick, Okay. Um, there is a free point within this segment. So if you follow the direction that it tells you to do, you get a free point in this segment, okay? Um, also, if you guys want to take a quick restroom break after this segment, we can definitely do that, okay? So we'll just take a little poll um, before we move to our next segment, okay? So let's generate some packets. Welcome back, guys. So we do have Johnny, and we know that we need to get started on his packet. So we need to start work within our packet process steps. Now, your very first step is to always access the resident or applicants at a glance page. And using our wonderful snapshot, we can do exactly that by clicking on the Quick Access tab under Name. Now, the reason why this is always going to be your very first step is because we've now automated your lease paperwork to read what's within one site. So if the information is missing here, then it's going to be missing when we access our packet. If the information is incorrect here, then it's going to be incorrect when we generate within our packets. Which leads us to step two, which is doing your due diligence. And this is probably the most important out of all of your steps. When doing your due diligence, there's going to be a few key areas that you are going to want to get in the habit of double checking to ensure that when your documents generate, they generate correctly. And the first key area is going to be here under lease summary, verifying that that lease start date and lease end date truly matches what that person had applied for. Next, we're going to move up to our contact section. And here, we're going to verify that anybody that should be marked as a lease signer has that little S symbol or the lease signer responsibility assigned to them. And that if they are a lease signer, that they have the appropriate relationship status to go along with that. Relationship statuses become extremely important when we get to your required signatures a little later on. Next, we're going to move up to our miscellaneous tab. And here we're going to check that if they have any vehicle information, that we're going to store that here within that vehicle section. And we're going to do the same thing for any animals that they may have within the household. Now, certain areas are more important when doing your due diligence, and your pets area will be one of those. Reason being is certain items within your packet can be controlled by these areas. And we do this by constraints. Constraints look in the household for which a certain item will be generated for to know whether or not it's needed. And pet related items typically have a constraint placed on them. So if that constraint notices that no items are listed in the pet section, it will assume the household has no pets and therefore will hide any of those pet requirements like your pet addendas, vaccination record requirements, etc. You'll also see this for any rentable items or concessions. So those areas too, you want to 
truly, truly do a really good due diligence on. Now the last area that we want you guys to get in the habit of double checking is going to be down here under scheduled billing. And here you're going to verify whether or not all of your charges or credits have been listed. So we're going to be looking for any pet rents, rentable items, any concessions, any one-time fees, and of course our rental amount. Now as a note, any one-time fees or concessions do have a very particular way that they need to be entered into scheduled billing to be accounted correctly within your custom packets. And as you can see here, I do have an example of that. So I have a one-time fee for pets, along with my reoccurring rent assessment. Now to distinguish the difference between those, they must be given a different frequency. So your one-time fees need to be given a daily frequency, and the start date and end date must match one another. So that way one site can read that this pet fee will be charged on a daily basis, but only truly gonna charge for one day. So what we're gonna verify is that all charges are there and they are set up correctly. Now, once we have verified all of the information, all of our due diligence points, and we feel everything is up to date, we are now ready to move to our third step, which is to actually access the packet. For a move-in packet, we will be able to access this by going through our move-in wizard on the left-hand side. When selecting this, you'll notice that it now becomes part of your move-in checklist. And your move-in checklist is something you are all familiar with today. But what you're most familiar seeing are probably the first two columns, which is your required task and your additional tasks. But now with custom packets, you are going to have a third column called documents. And this is where your packet will be stored. Now your documents section is an extension of your required task meaning that you have to have a green check mark out beside your packet link before you're given the ability to move that person into one site. So remember I told you that anybody in pending packet status, we were physically unable to move in? Well, this is exactly why. So we need to get that green check mark out beside our packet. Now, once inside your packet, your eyes are probably going to be drawn first and foremost to these nasty red X's we see to the right hand side of the page. And trust me, I don't like them either. But these red X's directly correlate to yet another number from that today page view. This time, it's connected to your required documents number. So we knew before even going into Johnny's account that we were going to have eight requirements that needed to be completed. And now that we're actually in Johnny's account, we can see exactly what eight requirements they are because they're indicated by that red X. So there's absolutely no surprises when working within custom packets. So I need to change each and every one of these red X's to a green check mark in order to move this packet to completed status and in order to get my move in ability. To do this, I find it's easiest when you understand what your red X is actually connected to within the packet itself. And we can gain this information by following that red X to the center here under description. And you'll notice that most of your requirements say the word form out beside it. And those that say form is referring to your actual lease paperwork and addendas that need to be generated, provided to the household for them to review and sign. But you may notice that not every single one of your requirements say the word form out beside it. Those that do not say form are what we call your placeholders. And these are itemized storage space for the items you need to collect from that resident or applicant. 
Once you understand what you're working with, you can now prioritize what needs to be done sooner rather than later. And as a best practice, I feel it's always easiest to start work on your forms first because they tend to take the majority of those requirements. So we need to get these forms generated. And what's the easiest way to do that but to go to Generate Forms. Now one thing that you're going to notice with Custom Packets is that it is a very common sense based product. And when you think about it in those terms, what you need to do next becomes very apparent. Typically, you can always ask yourself one main question, which is overall, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? And when you answer that question, typically the button that you need to select from the top becomes pretty clear. So in this case, overall, what is it that we're trying to achieve? We're trying to get these documents generated. All right, well, that clears which button I select, which is Generate Forms. Now, when I select Generate Forms, one side is going to kick in for you guys, and it's going to start doing as much work as it can on your behalf. Starting with the fact that any form that it sees within this packet, it's now going to pre-list for you here. And if that item is marked as a requirement, it pre-selects that item as ready to generate for you as well. So typically, all that you have to do is go down to the very bottom of the page and select Generate. Now, one more text box is going to appear. This text box is what we call your User Defined Merge Fields. And it is exactly that. You're the user, and you're going to be defining the answers to these questions. These happen because we may not have the ability to automate certain items within your agendas. And those will be what you guys will physically type the answer to so that it can appear within those respective areas. Now, under description and instruction, you should be able to find all of the information you need to answer those questions under value. But you've noticed that I have not yet done anything to this window, and half of my answers are already here. This is again one site doing what it can on your behalf. One site understands that even though this question can vary, the chances that it does vary is very slim. So it pre-selects the most common answer. A great example of that is going to be, is the unit furnished or unfurnished? Knowing that the unit is unfurnished most commonly, one site pre-selects that value. But if you ever needed to change a pre-selected value, you can easily do so by either clicking on the Quick Access tab, removing and replacing the text that is seen within the text box, or selecting a different answer from a pull-down list. Either way, you will need to answer everything to its full stability before hitting Save at the bottom of the screen. So what's going to start happening now is one side is going to start that generation process, pulling in all of that needed information onto your lease documents. And that's going to take it a few moments to do that, so be patient with your program. Now, we'll need to monitor our notes column before we do anything else because that notes column will tell us when the packet has finished that generation process. So what we're looking for under this notes column is a very long message. We don't want any short and dinky messages, which is what we see here. So I joke with all of my clients, under your notes column, size matters. The longer, the better. Like most things in life, this is true here as well. So what we can do if we see a shortened dinky message is we can go to the top of the page and select Refresh Contents. If you've given it a moment to finish that generation process, typically when you click Refresh Contents, all of them will update to that much longer message. And when we hover over this new notes column, it will physically tell us that each form has been generated. And that is what we're looking for. 
if you ever see a short message and you try to skip this step and send it out for signature, that document is no longer a part of the packet and the resident or applicant will not see nor will be able to sign that document. So we have to make sure that the notes column has been monitored and has that longer message before we proceed. Once you are ready, we're now going to click print view packet. Now this will not automatically send these documents to your printer because that would be counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. But what it will do is pull up a PDF version of what it is that you've just generated, allowing you the chance to verify that everything truly matches what it should match within one site. So all amounts are correct, all names are correct, you have all the addendas that you need, etc. Now, if you guys are doing this due diligence and you're noticing that something is not generating correctly, consistently, or that you're missing documents consistently, then it's for you to inform your corporate team members of those issues. Because during this time frame, if you guys have never used custom packets before, you do have a real page document management consultant that can help your corporate team get these packets exactly the way you need them. But the only way that your corporate team and real page will know that there's an issue is if you guys are taking the time and verifying that here within that print view step. So once you've taken your time to verify that information, you can then click close off of that print view, which will jump you right back into your packet. So at this point, we've generated all of our addendas. We know that that generation process is completed and we have verified that what was generated was correct. So now we're ready to get this packet out for signature. Now you can collect signatures two different ways within one site. Now we understand that even in this techy techy world that we live in, there's still those random few people that don't want anything electronic. Maybe they don't even have an email. And that's perfectly fine. They can still sign their documents the old fashioned way using pen and paper. One site calls that pen and paper signature OFSA. And you can see that out beside each and every one of your agendas. OFSA stands for On File Signature Authorization. Now besides your pen and paper signature, you also have the ability now for electronic signatures via DocuSign. It is important to know which way your household wants to sign before selecting one of your two options though. Because once a signature selection has been made, the other option will be removed from that packet. So if I had a household of three lease signers, and that first lease signer wanted to sign electronically with DocuSign, and I selected that method, that would now mean that every other lease signer and management would also have to sign electronically as well. And vice versa, if that first person wants to sign pen and paper, that now means that everybody else must sign pen and paper to move forward. So I'm gonna say that I contacted Johnny and I know that he is super busy in Hollywood, so he wants to sign electronically. Well, now that I know that about him, I can select the proper method. Now here's a huge, huge tip for you guys. Anything, absolutely anything involving signatures, you are always going to select sign documents. So I'm going to do that now. Now both signature options that I have available are here for me to select what I want to use to move forward. I know Johnny wants to sign electronically, so I'm going to keep it on DocuSign and select sign at the bottom of the window. Now, if you had not done that due diligence check on the contact section before getting to this screen, you may not have every lease signer that you need to select from. Reason being is DocuSign will instantly list anybody that it recognizes as a required signer. 
And in order for DocuSign to do that, they must meet two overall requirements within OneSite. Those requirements being that they are actually marked as a lease signer, so showing that little S symbol out beside their name. And the other is that they're given a particular relationship status. Two relationship statuses in particular are seen as a required signature for DocuSign. And that's going to be head of household or adult co-head of household. Now, from time to time, you may not see adult co-head of household as an available status, depending on your company build. And if that's the case, you can choose co-head of household in lieu of the adult co-head of household. But as best practice, the two that you should get in the habit of assigning will be head of household or adult co-head of household, as most other statuses will not be recognized as a required signer. And if you notice their name missing here, you're going to have to go back all the way to that due diligence step, correct the relationship status, and work your way back to this step. Now, Johnny is my only lease signer, and I do have his name here, so I am ready to proceed. And it does pull in Johnny's email and cell phone number from what we had listed in the contact section. But this is still fully text enabled, so if I need to change this, I certainly can. But I would note that if you change this email address or the cell phone number, it will automatically change what it pulled from under the contact section as well. Now to get this out to him electronically, you are given a few different methods, which you can notice here under action. Most commonly, you guys will use the send email option here, which is what I will do within my training for you today. In order to use the send email option, every person listed must have their own unique email address. So if I had any same or duplicated emails, by clicking send email, it would give you an error message stating that they would need that unique email address to proceed. Now the secondary option here is called sign now. Your sign now method is, is really rarely used when sending for household signatures. But it's still nice to know why it is here in case you ever were to need it. When you click Sign Now, you're given three additional options to collect that electronic signature. Most commonly, if you were to ever use the Sign Now option, it would be for the very first selection, which is to send the documents to a resident's portal account instead. A portal account being a real page portal, such as Active Building, Welcome Home, Online Leasing, or Online Renewals. If you do not have a real page portal, then you do have the option of code methods available. The code method is what makes the sign now so rarely used, in my opinion, because it's a little bit redundant in the way that it operates. A code method is if you have somebody sitting with you in your office and they want to take control of your computer to sign their documents. Well, in order for one site to allow that to happen, one site needs to have some kind of authentication that this person truly is who they say they are. And the only way it can get it by sending a code. So it can send the code via email or by text message. Now, if they're willing to check their email to provide you a code, might as well just have them sign directly via email instead and cut out the middleman entirely. And same can typically be said with text message as well. So you do have additional options, but most times your send email will do exactly what you need. So your send email is also a one and done feature. So even if I had six lease signers names listed here, if I click send email once, it will truly send to everybody systematically. So I'm now going to go ahead and select that send email. And here in just a moment, I'm going to get a success message that tells me that that email has gone out. 
Now, before I click OK or close out of that success message, I want everybody to look into the background of the packet. And you're going to notice OFSA is still listed out beside each and every one of your addendas. The reason why I'm pointing that out to you is because when I do choose to close out of that message, it sends me right back to that previous page. And nothing here has been grayed out. Nothing here to indicate that I've done what I needed to do. And let's be honest, guys, you live crazy day-to-day -day lives. You never know what's going to happen or what your residents are going to throw at you from day to day. And sometimes I do quite literally mean throw at you, depending on what time of month it is. So you have to be ready for anything. So you're knocking this packet out, you're doing what you need to do, and you hit send email. And then instantly a resident wants to come storming into your office, and they just need to complain to you that their neighbor is like a tap dancing maniac at 3 a.m. in the morning. Now you know that's not real, but you still have to graciously listen to this resident as they complain on and on and on for an hour of your time. Finally, they leave your office and you come right back to your computer screen and you see this. Again, nothing grayed out. So your very first instinct with all of those crazy details in your head is to hit send email again. What happens when we do this is it truly does send another packet to that resident or applicant and it will void out or error out any previous packets that were sent. So if they were right in the middle of signing that packet and you got distracted and hit send email again, it's going to error them out right in the middle of signing, which is extremely frustrating for them, which means it's going to be extremely frustrating for you when they call you to complain. So as a tip, if you ever need to know whether or not this packet has already been sent for signature, you can always find that information by just going right back to the packet itself. So closing out of the screen, if under actions within the packet, you see this word status, that is your instant giveaway that these documents have been sent for electronic signature. And the status button will tell us exactly how far our residents are at within the signing process as well. So if I click status, it's going to show me to whom this has been sent to and overall where they're at within that document. So for Johnny, it shows sent, which tells me that Johnny hasn't even opened his email yet. Now, once he has and he started reading his documents, but he hasn't started signing anything yet, then it's going to show delivered. And then once he has signed that respective addenda, it's going to show completed. So if I do have that really large household of four or five lease signers and I'm trying to figure out who I should follow up with versus who I should not, that status button is gold, giving us exactly that information the moment that we need it. So I'm going to say that I sent this packet out to Johnny at 5 p.m. and then I'm going on vacation the next day. But Johnny had a move-in day two days from today's date. So I asked my coworker if they wouldn't mind following up with him, making sure he had a smooth move-in. And hopefully if you have some nice coworkers, they're going to agree. So your coworker is going to come in the next morning, also having access to this packet leasing summary snapshot. And they're going to be able to see everything that we saw about the basic information on the left hand side and see any progress we have made within that packet on the right hand side. Specifically, they're going to notice that within the back four. Again, your back four numbers will always tell you what has already happened in the packet to date. So when we started the packet, remember we had four big zeros, but now we only have two. So when reading the very first column of your back four numbers, it says required documents generated. And I see the number six here. This tells me that six out of the required eight documents have been generated. And the same six 
have not yet been finalized. So I know that some work's been done, but more work is needed. So at this point, I can check on how far that work has gotten by simply clicking on that packet link. And if I see that word status again, that tells me that my coworker has already sent this out for signature, and there's really nothing else I need to do except wait for Johnny to sign. So what is your resident or applicant going to see from their side of things? Now, they are only going to get an email from DocuSign. And this could be important to stress to them because they could be expecting an email from a personal email or a community email. But once they've been able to locate the needed DocuSign email, they'll be able to verify everything within the email's preview before clicking on the DocuSign link. So here they will verify their full name, the full name of every addenda that we've sent to them, and the dates associated with it. Once they felt comfortable accessing the DocuSign link, they'll simply click on the yellow link at the top, which will open up DocuSign in a secured window, which we can tell by the lock on the top left-hand side. Now, as Johnny, I can see my documents, but I don't have immediate access to them. And that's because I would first have to agree to an electronic signature disclosure here at the top left-hand side of the page. Now, I'm within a testing environment. I do this a bazillion times a day, so it's not having me do that again within the test. But when we get to our required counter signatures, you'll be able to see that disclosure there. Now, once I sign that disclosure and hit continue, I'll gain access to my documents. And once I've reviewed everything, I can start signing them by clicking the start button on this left hand side. Now, once I am ready to sign my very first signature or initial, it would have me select my signature style. Again, within a testing environment, you can't see that now, but you will see it for the counter signature portion. But if I were to scroll up, you can see that the signature I chose is not the most ordinary signature. But whenever they select that signature, they are legally bound to the signature that they chose. So it does not matter what they select. It is still a legal binding signature. Now, once they start the signing process, DocuSign will instantly start rapid firing all the documents that are required. But if for any reason a signature is missed and they carry downwards, it will never allow them to bypass overall that requirement. So when I sign this last one or what I think is the last one, it's going to instantly boomerang me to where that missing signature was found. Let's say I got lost in my documents and I just don't know if I've signed everything. The button on the left hand side, if it's ever clickable or at least present, then you know that there is a missing signature. And if you click on it at any time, it's going to take you straight to it. Now, if I try to finish my packet without signing everything, it's going to highlight those missing signatures in red. Absolutely no way for them to bypass. So once I finally give in and sign that very last signature, You'll notice that button on the left hand side disappears and when I click finish, it's going to allow me to do so. Taking me to a white screen that says you're done and it informs me that when everybody has signed these documents, meaning the office is countersigned, that I as the resident will get a copy for my own records and DocuSign does that for you guys all on its own. So as soon as you guys place your counter signature, instantly they're going to be emailed a copy for them to download for their own records. So just another thing that DocuSign takes off your plate. So we're going to say that Johnny signed that in the middle of the night. We come in the next morning and we need to check on what's happened within our packet. And again, we can do this on our today page by using our snapshots. Now, if you are a manager on the line with me today, 
this is where I really need you to pay attention. I'm hoping that you've listened to everything so far, but this column in particular is going to be your baby. So that column existing within your back four is going to be required documents ready for counter signature. So it tells you exactly that. So you're the manager and it's time for you to countersign six documents. Now, if this column is ever a zero, it means that the ball is not yet within your court. But if it is ever anything other than a zero, then that means it's time for you to jump in and place that needed counter signature. Now, in order for you to countersign a document, you must be given a very particular role within one site. And this role would be an eDoc signer role. This role will be determined by your company super user and is not assigned by your doc management consultant if you have one. So if you feel as though you should have the ability to countersign documents, but currently do not, I would advise that you reach out and consult with your company super user to get that ability. So I am the manager for this community. I do have the needed eDoc signer role, and I can clearly see that this column is no longer zero. So I need to jump in and place that counter signature. With ease from my snapshots, I'm going to use my quick access tab under packet name to access that packet. And anything, absolutely anything involving signatures, I'm going to go through sign documents. Now DocuSign will instantly know it's time for counter signatures as well. And here it will list anybody within your company's portfolio that also has that needed eDoc signer role assigned to them. Now here is the very first red flag as to whether or not you are an eDoc signer. If your name is not the very first name you see when you are signed into this page, you are not an eDoc signer. But if your name is the very first name you see, you should have a sign now button that is illuminated. Now, besides your own name, again, anybody else within your company that has the same role will also be listed, but they are going to be given a send email option instead. And this is going to be a really, really great function for those that are not going to be assigned as an eDoc signer. Reason being is you as the manager are split in a million different directions at any given time. You could be helping out at a sister community one day, working from home the next, or listening to a really delightful lady for two hours the very next day. Either way, we don't want to limit your abilities by your location to a computer. So for that reason, let's say we have a leasing agent working by themselves in the office one day, and they have somebody come in, look and lease, and want to move in right then and there. Well, that leasing agent can do everything that we've done up until this point. But instead of finding their own name, they would scroll down and find your name or anybody else within your company's portfolio that is also an eDoc signer and select send email. That way, no matter your location, as long as you have a smart device present, which if we're being honest, you sleep with it, you're going to be able to pull up that email, place your counter signatures and allow your leasing agent to continue without any hindrance. So a lot of built in functionality. But if you are on your own computer, you can skip ahead and simply click Sign Now under Actions, which will pull up DocuSign right here within OneSite. Now, remember I told you that a lot of functionality we didn't get to see in the resident side of things, like the signature disclosure or the selection of my signature itself. You will get to see that here for the counter signature. So at the top of the page is that electronic record and signature disclosure that everybody must agree to before they sign. 
if they want to read that disclosure word for word. I don't know why they would want to, but they certainly can by clicking on it. And if they just want to smash a button, they can do that as well and hitting continue. Now, once I go down and I select my very first signature, again, I'm given the option to select my signature style. Now, if I feel I'm fancy and I want to change the style that I'm given originally, I can choose from a pre-selected list. But if I just feel I'm just super duper fancy, I can even draw a new signature. Noting again that whatever I draw is legal binding. But I'm plain Jane or plain Joan in this case, so I'm going to accept what DocuSign gave me and hit adopt and sign. And I too am required to sign everything that is required. Once the button on the left has disappeared, I should be able to click finish without any problems. Now DocuSign is going to finish its signing process and pop me right back into my packet view. But my packet at this point is slightly behind us, so we need to give it a little bit of time to catch up. So we are going to hit refresh contents. And when we do, all of those nasty red X's change to that beautiful green check mark. And that's exactly what we want to see. But even with all of our forms completed, we still can't move Johnny in. Why? Well, because we still have red X's within the packet. And these red X's are connected to our placeholders, the items that we need to collect from Johnny. So a placeholder can hold one upload. Now, before you freak out, let me clarify what that means. So using proof of income as an example, you most commonly require two paycheck stubs. So what we would do is we would scan in those two paycheck stubs as one document to our computer. We would then be able to upload it to its respective placeholder. So I have Johnny's proof of income and I'm ready to upload it. So I'm going to go out to that more and select attach document. Now it will always remind you to what placeholder you're uploading to and for whom and will give you the ability to search your computer for that respective item. Once you've located it, it will give you the ability to attach down at the bottom of the screen. Now, let's say that we've already reviewed this proof of income. We know that it's good to go. We're just now uploading it to the packet. Towards the top of the page, you will see this finalize button here. By selecting this, this is saying that the item is already approved. So when I hit attach, I'm instantly given a green checkbox for that item. But that may not always be the case. Again, in the example, I'm a leasing consultant. I don't have the authority to approve income. My job is only to upload it or collect it. So I'm going to say that I've collected it and I've hit attached. I'm going to hit refresh contents to allow the documents to pull through. And you can see that the documents have that nice beefy long message, which is what we're looking for. But it still has that red X. And that is because I did not finalize the item while I was attaching it. So I contact my manager. I tell him Johnny's income is ready for them to approve. The manager from their today page will access that packet locate that proof of income and they can click view to actually see what was downloaded. They're going to check it to make sure it meets all of their criteria and if it does, out beside that same item they're going to click more and change status to final which is basically telling one site, hey I did what I needed to do, give me my green check mark. And it will do exactly that. Now, uploading to a placeholder is always going to be consistent, always following the same steps over and over. So for my proof of renter's insurance, I'm going to do the same exact steps. More, 
Attach Document, Locate my item on my computer, but this time I am going to finalize it right here as I'm attaching it, which means that the item has already been reviewed and approved. So when I hit Attach and refresh my contents this time, I'm instantly given a green check mark and do not have the additional step of manually approving it. But even though it's already approved, I will always have the ability to click View out beside the item to check what was uploaded, just like I would do with any pen and paper file folder as well. So I have no remaining red X's within Johnny's packet. So when I go up to the top of the page, under Packet Status, you'll now notice it shows Completed. So when I close out of Johnny's packet view, you're going to notice that his name is going to instantly be removed from my pending packet status in my Today page snapshot. And it happens rather quickly. So I won't be able to track him any longer from pending, but I will now be able to track him from completed. And Johnny's going to stay right here in completed packet status until we've moved him in. Once we have moved him in, the packet status will then move from completed and will file itself away for us down here under closed. Now, I know that was a lot of information, but that was actually the majority of our call. So let's go ahead and launch our largest quiz starting right now. <laughs> Right, guys see it wasn't that bad but that was our longest section we try to keep you know make that um move in packet pretty beefy because you will be going through the the same steps through each of the other processes so you know make one of them big and make the other one small okay now for the move in packet quiz i would like to award uh two points to the first person who answers and be sure to raise your hand at the end so I can, you know, see that you have completed. Okay, so here comes our quiz. Nicely done, M.O. Nicely done. And then like Jennifer said, it's when it comes to one site, it can it kind of leads the way. The buttons kind of tell you what they're there for. And then if you just follow the process, bam, be done and done in no time there. Okay, so we're just waiting on Nisha right quick. And, you know, while we're waiting, um, quick show of hands. Do you guys want to take a quick break after this, uh, after we review for the quiz? Okay. All right. No problem. And I will still be here if you guys uh, want to, you know, chat me. If you want to Q&A with me, I'll be here. All right, guys. So let's see what kind of answers we came up with on our move-in packet quiz. Question number one. What must happen before you process a packet? At 100%, yes, you have to do your due diligence. You have to double check all of the information. Now, you want to make sure that there's pricing um, entered under scheduled billing. Uh, if there's a pet, make sure the pet is entered under the miscellaneous tab. Same thing with the vehicle. So you want you know, want to make sure that you do your due diligence. So very good job on that one. Woo -woo. Question number two. What do you click to generate all the forms in the packet? You click generate forms. Yes, generate forms. It's telling you exactly what its purpose is. Nice job. Question number three. What are the two acceptable relationship statuses for a lease signer? Now, this one right here, I used to think this was a trick question, 
but it didn't trick you guys at all. Okay, because, okay, so we know head of household, that is a given, okay? Some properties are set up to use co-head of household as their uh, secondary signer. Some properties are adult co-head of household as that secondary signer. So both of those would be correct. So nicely done on that one. You guys are knocking it out the park. Question number four, true or false? You should review the notes column after the packet has been sent for signature. This one used to be my trick question, but again, it didn't trick you guys at all. No, you look for the notes column before you send that thing out because you want to make sure that if you have a, the short message on some of them, long message on the other ones, only the ones with the long message would be sent out for signature. The other ones are just going to be sitting there waiting, la, 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 when is it our turn? So be sure that you have that long message before you send it out. Thank you very much for catching that one. Nice job. Question number five, what does user define mean? <laughs> Once again, you guys are killing it. Yes, that is right. That's the manual entry questions. Um, and like Jennifer said, you're the user, you're defining the answer. Very nice job on, on that part. Question number six, true or false? You cannot complete a move in if there are red X's in the packet. That is true. You can, you can get pretty far. I mean, we're not going to make it seem like you can't, but you cannot complete the process if there are red X's still there. Okay. So the, you guys are doing great. Question number seven, how do you send the packet for electronic signature? You click sign documents. Jennifer said, anything involving a signature you're gonna press sign documents. Now I know that there's another option there, but that does not work <laughs> for packets, okay? Email notification does not work in our process. That has nothing to do with our process, okay? So it's always going to be sign documents. All right. So, I mean, if you guys want to take a quick break, I have 3.15 Central my time. If you, uh, five minutes, 3.20, if you want to, you know, come back, uh, just ping me. Let me know when you are back and we can, you know, get started, okay? All right, thanks. I'm still here if, if, if you guys, you know, have any questions for me.
Is anyone here with me right now? Thanks, Amy. <laughs> oh. All right, Mo, thanks for letting me know. Mo, uh, where are you located? What part of the world are you located in? Houston, nice. Oh, you guys are about to get slammed. Come on, we, we got a little room for you, but you know, you got to leave after the storm. <laughs> I'm in Dallas, Texas, um, and I saw earlier that they had um, removed the toll restrictions on the toll road in Houston so that you guys could uh, start planning your evacuation. Yeah, so you guys, you know, be be safe, man. I think it's two storms back to back. Okay. Yeah, definitely be safe, man. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna yes, I can Harvey, exactly. Well, still, if you wanna, you know, head up 45 north, <laughs> come come on to Houston. We're here. Yeah, Amy says, please be safe. Okay, I wonder if Nisha has come back. Yes, we definitely will pray for you. One of our sister cities. Okay, so, so far, <clears throat> we have learned about the Today page and how to set up its the snapshots. We have, you know, just taken a, a major spin on the move-in packet. So now we're about to learn how to make changes to a packet, okay? All right, guys, so let's generate some packets. So Johnny here is in completed packet status, meaning we've completed all of that paperwork. We have got beautiful green check marks for everything, and we are just coasting till his move-in date. And then Johnny calls us, as they always do after everything's done. And they have to tell us that he needs to change his move-in dates, or he forgot to mention he had a pet, or maybe he noticed something was incorrect within his packet. And you kind of freak out because everything now is electronic. So how do we correct something that is wrong or out of date within our existing packet? I think everybody's knee-jerk reaction to this is to delete the packet and to start all over again. And that reaction is so wrong on so many different levels, but I'm going to stress on it mainly for two. The first reason why we never delete our packet is because it does nothing more but create more work for you. Reason being is your packet is an automated process. So when you delete it, you're deleting its ability to auto-generate and auto-create. So you would have to then manually create something that was already there to begin with and manually regenerate and re-upload items that maybe weren't incorrect all completely together. The second and most important reason why we never delete a packet is because it's extremely harmful for our program you are given 50 gigs of data storage, which is ultimately a really healthy limit. 
But if you guys are not maintaining your data storage wisely, it is quite possible to reach that data limit prematurely. So why is deleting a packet so harmful for your data storage? Well, deleting a packet does not do what most assume that it does. Most people assume that when you delete a packet, it's going to delete all of that paperwork that exists within the packet. And it does the complete opposite of that. When you delete a packet, all that it does is delete the shell that was holding everything. So remembering that a packet is nothing more than a file folder that holds or contains everything, when you delete that, you've deleted only what was holding those items, meaning that all of the items that were within that packet are now still stored within your program, but more or less scattered within your one site. So all of that data is still being utilized. So then when you manually go in and recreate that packet that you deleted and regenerate everything within that packet, you now duplicated the data because you never really got rid of the items that existed within the pre-existing packet and now have regenerated items within the new packet. So it is extremely, extremely harmful for your data usage. So if we don't delete our packets, what do we do when the information is incorrect? Well, the answer here is really simple. You're actually just going to follow your packet process steps just like we did originally. And that first step always being starting at the resident or applicants at a glance page. That second step being doing your due diligence. So making sure the information is correct here. And what goes hand in hand with doing that due diligence, but correcting anything that was incorrect to begin with. So if he needed to change his move in date, then while doing our due diligence, we're going to make that change. If we needed to add something or remove something or change something, again, we would do that while doing the due diligence portion of our packet process steps. Now, after the steps and changes have been made, the third step would be to access our packet, which for our move in, we accessed through our move in wizard under our move in checklist. Now, once inside our existing packet, we will get to select the items that we need to remove. So whether we need to update all of the addendas within this packet, that's perfectly fine. We can select all of them. Maybe only one or two items need updating. That's fine as well. We can select whatever it is we feel needs to be updated. Now, once we've selected the items, we're then going to go to this top toolbar called Actions. And under Actions, there's going to be a Remove Selected Document from Packet, which is going to tell us that it's going to permanently remove this item from document management, meaning from our data storage, which is exactly what we want to see because we need to bring in the new information and that new data storage without duplicating the storage needed. So we're going to be brave and go ahead and click Yes here. Now, once we do, we're going to notice that it does give us back our nasty red X over here. And any red X means that we're right back in pending packet status. But thankfully, we know the cure to any red X. If that red X is connected to a form under description, what are we going to do? We're going to generate that form. We're going to answer any of those manual entry points known as user defined fields. We're going to monitor that notes column for that nice long message. We're going to click print view packet for accuracy. And then we're going to send it back out for signature using signed documents. If that red X is connected to a placeholder like it is in this example, I'm going to click more attach document. Locate the item on my computer. Finalize it here or finalize it afterwards and hit attach. And just by following my same packet process steps as I would have originally, I've changed that red X right back to its green check mark. And this data is the most up to date data that I need. So always doing this will save you steps and data versus the really, really, really bad option of clicking delete packets.
So let me show you exactly what I mean when you do the bad no-no of deleting the packet. So when you go to your Docs tab for any resident or applicant, at the top of the page, there will be this data usage log, always informing you and giving you a good glance as to how much data your site is currently using. Now for my site, I have 0.15% of data. Now one would wrongly assume that when I delete this packet, I would have deleted everything within the packet that's consuming data. So when I click delete, I would assume that my data usage would lower. But when I go back and I check after that update, you're going to notice that your data usage stays exactly the same. Because you didn't actually delete anything within the packet, all that you've done is deleted the packet itself or the file folder itself. But all that paperwork that was actually existing within that packet is still here. It's still eating all of our data storage, hanging out, homeless, permanently, because we deleted the shell that contained it. So now when we would go in and manually recreate a new packet and we regenerated everything that was within that packet, that's still technically here, I would have duplicated the data that I needed and would have ultimately hurt my data usage. So really, really, really bad. Always, always update your existing packets. Never delete your packet. Which does lead us to our next quiz. I'm pretty sure you can figure out what the topic is, but we will see after this break. Starting now. See, not that bad. It was a quick segment right there. Okay, so like Jennifer said, you know, there, we know that you guys have learned all kinds of different ways to finagle things inside of OneSite. But being best practice, you know, we just kind of try to keep you guys away from deleting a packet unless, you know, there are just certain specifications met. Okay, so I'm about to launch the quiz. Um, let's see, right now, Mo is in the lead with four points. So let's do uh, two points to the first person who answers all questions and raises their hand at the end. Here comes the quiz. Ooh, light and fast. You go, Mo. Anisha, it is still anyone's game. We still have a few modules to go. But when I tell you, we are, we have about 30 minutes left and we are adjourned. <laughs> All right, then. All right, so let's see what kind of answers we have on our making a change to a packet quiz. Question number one, true or false? If something is wrong in a packet, you should delete the packet and start again. 100% false. <laughs> Very nice job on that. Uh, yeah, we, you know, you're, it's not going to really help your data usage. The stuff is still, the forms will still be there unless you, you know, take them away. All right, question number two. In the packet, what do you click to remove a generated addendum? You click actions. You guys must already generate packets. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever had so many correct answers in total. Okay, let's keep going. Question number three, what column will inform you? It's time for management to place their counter signatures. And that is required documents ready for counter signature. 
Exactly right. And I, I know right now when you, unless your packet's are already live, but it, it's going to start at a zero. It's And you will be like, huh? it's just a zero. It, that, this column doesn't work. It doesn't work until after the renter has signed. And that's the trigger for that column. And then you'll have a number there. And you're like, oh, now it's my turn to sign. So very good job on that one. Question number four. What role does a property manager need to have within one site to be able to countersign in packets? Ding, ding, ding. It's the eDoc signer. It tells you exactly what it's for. Electronic document signer. Um, and I know it's some properties you guys are, you know, don't use that, that role. So, I mean, we... Uh, as we're building your package, just let us know how you have your countersigners set up and we can easily update the signature blocks to match that, okay? All right, guys, so, so far, <laughs> so far we have, you know, learned about the Today page and the snapshots. We have processed a move-in packet. We now know how to make changes to a packet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to learn about the renewal packet. We know that this is one that you guys will use very often. Keep this in mind. There's one way to generate a packet, a renewal packet, okay? Very specific steps, okay? So like I like to say, let's generate packets. Now let's go ahead and talk about renewal packets. For the most part, it's going to stay identical to what we saw within our move-in process. But there are going to be some key differences that I want you to be aware of. One of those key differences is actually here on our Today page. And it's involving which day counter we're going to pay attention to and why. So for a move-in packet, I told you to pay attention to the days remaining before packet due which told us how many days we had from that system date to their desired move-in date. But for a renewal packet, we have to pay attention to the first day counter instead, which says days until offer expires. Now this day counter is going to become literal life or death for your renewal packets. And guys, I do not say that to be dramatic with you. I say it to be completely honest because your renewal packet is internally linked to the renewal offer itself. So if the offer expires, so does your packet and all of the documents within that packet. And if the packet expires, you cannot renew that person within one site. So it becomes a complete system shutdown if you let this day counter hit day zero. Also, this day counter is not counting just to when that packet is due, but it's also counting down to when that person has to be renewed within one site, which means that this is going to continue to count against you even in completed packet status. So before this counts all the way down to zero or in the negative, we have to have the packet completed and we have to have the person renewed within one site. Now, other than that, the other main difference that you're going to see is where you're able to access a renewal packet. For a move-in packet, we accessed it by going through our move-in wizard as it became part of our move-in checklist. But obviously, we're not going to have a move-in wizard for a renewal. So we're going to access our renewals packet by going through our renewals wizard at the residence at a glance page. And we're going to select renew go month to month, which really is like a renewals checklist of sorts. Other than those two main differences, everything else will be pretty identical, including the fact that our lease renewal packet is also one that can auto generate for us. And its trigger action is the creation of a new renewal offer within one site. Now today within one site, you can create renewal offers several different ways. You can do them in bulk using your administration tab, or you can do them individually using the residence at a glance page. 
But either way that you choose to do it will result in a packet creation stored here on your packet leasing summary snapshot. But for my training purposes, I'm going to do it individually by going through a residence at a glance page. And we're going to use Bob as our example. And we're going to go through renewals, generate renewal offers to create the offer itself. Now within the offer window at the top of the page, there will be a days valid number. Now this number will be dependent upon your company setup and typically ranges anywhere from 30 to 120 days. But whatever number you see here will determine what your day counter starts at as soon as we hit save. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my offers that I have for Bob, whatever they may be. And anything in addition to his monthly rent, I need to make sure is in the additional billing area of the offer itself. So this is going to be that pet rent, that rentable item, any concessions, anything like that needs to be in the additional billing of the offer. So a caveat when we're doing our due diligence is that we cannot verify pricing information through scheduled billing because scheduled billing is only looking at what their current lease states. And that's not very helpful for us to verify the future amounts that we're trying to pull through our documents. And future scheduled billing doesn't get updated until we've renewed the person within one site, which again, we can't finish the renewal until their packets have been completed. So the only place that you guys are going to be able to do due diligence on for pricing will be within the offer itself checking the rent amount and any additional billing items in the additional billing area. Once I verified in full, I'm going to go ahead and hit save to create that new offer. Now, once I've created that offer, I will be able to go to my today page and locate a new packet for Bob. by going to packet type and selecting lease renewal and under pending status, here he is. And I'm going to be able to track him exactly the same way that I did for my move in. So that left hand side just being the informational piece and the right hand side being my progress piece. So on my right hand side, the day counter that matters to me is this days until offer expires. And this can be filtered to bring those running out of time to the front of your page for you to easily prioritize. So for Bob, I am very unfortunate and only have one day to finish his entire renewal. Within that one day, I have six required documents I need to complete. And within my back four, I can see that nothing's been done to this packet just yet. Now, typically, you guys will have a much healthier number to work with than I do. But normally your residents are going to hem haw on the offers that they have, and that's completely normal. But once your resident has reached out to you and let you know what offer works for them, that's when you can start your packet process steps. So Bob has reached out and he wants to do a 12 month lease. Now that I know that, I'm going to start those same steps by one, going through my residence at a glance page. Two, doing my due diligence and doing pricing due diligence through the offer itself. And then three, I'm going to access my packet. So I'm going to access my renewals packet by going through renewals, renew, go month to month. But let's say that you try to cut corners and you're trying to save time. So you're going to skip your packet process steps and you're going to try to access your packet directly from your today page. When you do, you will notice that one site will stop you dead in your tracks. It will not allow you to move forward generating any of your documents until you've done the initial process itself. So you always have to do those first three steps to move forward in any packet. So I'm going to go back 
Through renewals, renew go month to month, which is the only way to access a full functional packet, and select the offer that Bob has agreed to. Now, as soon as I make that selection, right below will be my packet, and that packet will now be internally linked to that offer's information. So the term itself, the amounts, the dates, all of that. But before we actually talk about a true lease term, let's talk about month to month for a second. Now, month to month, by definition, is not a lease term. As a lease term within one site is something that has a start date and end date. And as you can tell, month to month has neither of those. Packets are coded to read lease terms. So if we don't have a valid lease term, you are not going to be able to generate a renewal packet. So if we do select month to month, what we'll need to do is go to our packet and at the top of the page, select close packet. Now, when we do so, it's going to tell us this is against best practice and for any other reason it would be. But because month to month is not a true lease term and we couldn't use this packet, this would be one of your very rare scenarios where you have permission to manually close this packet and we would click confirm to do so. Now, if you're choosing to go against best practice, it is telling you to put a note within your activities tab so that your corporate team can see that you are within your rights or reasons to do so. So once I hit confirm, I would then be able to go back to my renewal, renew go month to month page and finish putting him on a month to month status. But hopefully that doesn't happen so, so often with you guys. Of course, your residents love you guys and want to stay with you long term. And that's definitely the case for Bob. He does want to stay with us another 12 months, which is an actual term. So we've selected that 12 months and we absolutely have to use a packet for this situation. So we're going to go ahead and click on our packet link. And now everything becomes identical to what we saw before. We can see our red X's. When following them to the center, we see most of those red X's are forms. And one is a placeholder for updated proof of renter's insurance. So I'm going to go ahead and upload that little proof of renter's insurance, following the same steps that I would have originally, finalizing it here or finalizing it afterwards. And then I can move on to working on my forms. So what would I need to do to complete my forms? I would go up to generate forms, allow one site to pull in all of my required forms and select generate at the bottom answering any of my user defined questions through that value section and hitting save. And then I'm going to monitor my notes column for that really beefy message. Remember, I don't want any short and dinky messages here. So when reviewing, I can see that I have two short and dinkies. So we need to wait just a moment and hit refresh contents for those to update to that longer, fully generated status. Once those have updated, we're then going to go to print view packet and do our due diligence on the documents themselves. Now, when we were talking about your move in, I did harp on this, but you guys didn't actually get to see that it was a built in requirement of the packet itself. But here you can. So if we move that packet in our document section for the renewal, we do have that print view packet marked as a requirement. So that means that even if I were to do everything else exactly right and get these to green check marks, I still would not be able to renew this person because I did not verify the documents first. So we're going to go ahead and do that due diligence by clicking print view packet, reporting anything that we're noticing inaccurate consistently to our corporate teams or going back and fixing anything that we noticed was wrong from our side of things as well. And once fully checked out, again, we're ready to go ahead and get these documents out for signature. But this time, we're going to say that Bob is old fashioned. He does want to come down and sign pen and paper with us. 
So when we select Sign Documents, and we're going to choose the OFSA Signature option instead. Now when someone chooses to sign pen and paper, we would print out that packet using our Print View Packet. We would allow them to place their pen and paper signature, and then we would place our pen and paper signature as well. Once all signatures were collected, would we then go into the packet and choose the OFSA option? The reason we do this afterwards is because your OFSA is not a signature at all, like it states here. It is a seal. It tells the system it can bypass the need for any electronic signature because a pen and paper signature was already collected. So when we choose OFSA and we hit sign, one site's going to verify with you twice. Are you sure you collected all the required signatures on all the required documents? If so, you're going to click sign. Are you really sure that you've done what you needed to do? And if so, you're going to click yes. Now one site will eventually trust you and will give you a confirmation. And when we hit OK, it's going to take us right back into our packet view. Now there's two types of OFSA seals that will be applied to your documents. If you are an eDoc signer or have that eDoc signer role, you will get what's considered a full seal. And it's very easy to tell if you have that. Because under the notes column, once applied, it will say OFSA seal and will have a green check mark out beside each and every one of your forms. If you are not an eDoc signer, it's going to give you a partial seal because one site recognizes that you technically don't have the authority to say management has signed. So it's only applying the seal for the resident. If you have a partial seal, under your notes column, it will still say OFSA seal has been applied, but out next to it, you're still going to have that red X. It's a very easy thing to solve. Just contact somebody within your company's portfolio whom is an eDoc signer and have them select sign documents. One site will recognize that they have the authority to sign those documents and will instantly prompt them to finish the seal. Now, all of these documents were signed pen and paper. I don't want to have to maintain a few pen and paper files while everything else is electronic. And for that reason, every single one of your packets will have an additional placeholder called PDF leases. And it is specifically here for you to upload anything that was signed pen and paper through this process. Now your PDF leases will always have the original lease dates. That's perfectly fine and you can ignore that. But if they signed anything pen and paper, like in this case, we're gonna upload those pen and paper documents to our computer as one document, and then we're going to upload it to this placeholder by clicking More, Attach Document, locating those newly signed documents, finalizing it here or finalizing it afterwards, and hitting Attach. Once we've done that, we're going to hit Refresh Contents to allow it to update to that green check mark. And just like that, this packet too will be in completed packet status. So when I go to my today page, I will no longer be able to find Bob from my pending packet status, but I will be able to track him from my completed status. Now remember, your day counter, days until offer expires, is still counting against you even in completed status. So if I don't finish his renewal and this hits day zero, the entire packet gets deleted. All the documents, all his signatures, all my signatures gets deleted and we have to start all over again. So as best practice, as soon as you get your packet to completed packet status, go ahead and finish his renewal fully so that you don't have to worry about this ever becoming a problem. So again, to renew him, you're gonna renew him the same way that you do today by going to his Renewals, Renew Go Month to Month page, finishing the actions in the center of the page, 
and hitting Next to verify any scheduled billing items and hit Next to get to your summary page. And when I select Finish, this is what's going to complete both packets and process. He's going to be fully renewed within one site and his packet has been filed away for us into our filing cabinet. And it's also been filed as a copy into his Docs tab for easy access anytime we need it as well. So now when I go to my Today page, I'm not going to see Bob from either pending or completed status. But when I go down to my filing cabinet, I would be able to locate them right here as closed. So let's go ahead and jump into our lease renewal quiz. Are you ready? Of course we're ready. Yeah, we're ready. All right. So um, like I said, when it comes to a renewal, you have to process a renewal packet in a particular way. It all involves renew go month to month. OK, now um, for the renewal quiz, I would like to award two points to the first person who answers all questions. Raise their hand at the end. OK, and here comes our quiz. Hi, Mo. And Mo, <laughs> do, do you guys already process packets in the in your office? What about you guys, Nisha? No? Okay. All right. About to go live. Yes, and we will push them live tomorrow morning. Woo! So exciting. Okay. So, I mean, you guys are just really given some good answers for this to be your, you know, first go around. So thank you so much for being in, engaged and, you know, participating in the quiz. Quizzes, sorry. Okay, so let's review. Let's see what kind of answers we have on our renewal packet quiz. Question number one, what column on your packet leasing summary snapshot is life or death for your renewal packets? That is Days until offer expires. Let me tell you what will happen. Okay, so let's say you you know the person has ex accepted the renewal offer. They have you know you generated the packet already. You've already sent it out for signature. The renter has signed it. It comes back. You have countersigned it. But if you have not gone through the rest of the steps to renew that renter in one site. Once that once it's, it, you reach the expiration date, the packet it deletes itself. It's gone. You have nothing. You have to start all over again. So just you know, be really careful with that day counter days until offer expires. Okay. Question number two: When is a renewal packet created? And that's when a renewal offer has been created in one site. Very good on that one. Woo woo. Okay, and that is the trigger. So the moment, like, let's say you go to generate offers, okay? You put the pricing in, make sure that if there's any additional billing items, the moment you press save, that's gonna trigger your packet. Your packet will, will create itself. And once you have the lease term, that's when you can go to renew, go month to month and you know start the process of generating the packet, okay? Very nice job there. Question number three, where do you generate the renewal packet? From renew go month to month. Exactly. Now, let me tell you why. Okay. So when it comes to, I know that, you know, you can go and initiate a packet 
several places. For instance, the Docs tab. Okay, I've, I've seen people do that all the time. But when it comes to a renewal packet, you have to go to renew, go month to month. Otherwise, it's going to show you current pricing. It's only going to show you current lease terms, not future pricing and future lease terms. Okay, so that's the importance of renew, go month to month. Question number four, where should you do your due diligence on pricing information before accessing the renewal packet? And that's going to be in the renewal offer. And I, I know that, um, you know, when it comes to like a move in, yeah, I would look in schedule billing, definitely. But when it comes to um, a renewal, you have to check your pricing in the renewal offer because it's looking, once again, in future scheduled billing, right? Okay. Question number five, can a packet be used for those who want to go month to month? No, not at all. You want to tell you why? Okay, let me tell you. When it comes to a packet, it's looking for a start date and an end date. But when it comes to a month to month, you don't have both of those parameters. You, you have a start, but you don't have an end. It's just open ended and a packet won't process itself if there's, you know, if it's open like that. OK, so you cannot use a packet for those that want to go month to month. Nice job there. OK, guys. So, so far, we have learned about the Today page and its snapshots. Uh, we processed a move in packet. We know how to make changes to a packet now. We have now processed a renewal packet. And lastly, our last one, this is our midterm packet. Now, this one you may not be too familiar with, so let us tell you about it. Okay, let's generate some packets. So our final packet that we are going to go over today is our midterm packets. And this one is very simple to explain because it's kind of like the hippy dippy of the packet family. The midterm packet is not connected to one specific process within one site. It's there for whenever you need it. It's there to cover whatever changes you feel have happened midterm or mid lease for that resident. So because that packet is not strictly tied to one process, it's going to be the only packet that does not automatically create itself for you. So that means that you will create a midterm packet when you feel it's needed. And also because a midterm packet is not automatically created, it will not have any automatic requirements and it will not have any automatic timeline to be completed by. So it is a fully manual process. So when a resident comes in to request a change from you guys, you're still going to loosely follow your packet process steps. So if they come in, they need to change a last name or maybe add a pet, you're still going to go and access that resident's account or add a glance page. You're still going to want to do your due diligence and verify that all of their information is up to date. And at that time that you're doing that due diligence, you would go ahead and input that newest change that was being requested. Now, one little caveat for midterm packets. They are only designed to read what's happening right now, meaning current. So if the resident or applicant is coming in and requesting anything involving future scheduled billing, then at that time, we would go ahead and input the charge, but we would have to wait until that charge became current before we could generate a midterm packet to show it. Other than that, any charge that is changed within current scheduled billing or any change that happens in current production, that should be an instantaneous showing within your packet. So let's say Eva came in here. She was getting married, so she was changing her last name. That has nothing to do with future scheduled billing, so we're going to change that last name as we're doing our due diligence. Now, the third step would typically be to access our packet. In previous examples, our packet was already created and waiting for us somewhere. But for a midterm packet, it does not automatically create itself. So in this case, we will create the midterm packet. 
By accessing our Docs tab, selecting Actions, and New Packet. And from the pull down, we are only ever going to select Midterm and hit Save. So once we've saved that packet, under any of the residents from that packet's file, we would then be able to select our packet link. Now once inside the packet itself, again, you're not going to have any initial requirements. So you're not going to have any initial red X's. This is your cherry picking packet. You select what you want when you want it. So when we select generate forms this time, we will select the forms that we wish to generate to cover this newest change. And once selected, we're going to hit generate at the bottom. Once you've selected the documents you need, you'll notice that things become similar to what we've seen in previous processes, including the fact that we would need to answer any user-defined fields that appear, monitor our notes column for that longer message, and we will notice now for any of the documents we selected, we have been given a red X. So we're going to complete that red X the same way that we would have for any others. Once that document has gone to that fuller message, we're going to click Print View Packet for Accuracy. Once verified that everything looks good, we're going to send that document out for signature using Sign Documents. Once signed and countersigned, if it was signed pen and paper, like in this case, I would want to make sure to upload it to my PDF leases placeholder. And once I've completed the items that I felt were needed for this process, those red X's would change to a green checkbox. And the packet status would then be able to move to completed packet status. But that's as far as a midterm packet can go on its own. Remember, a midterm packet is a completely manual process. It cannot automatically close itself, just like it cannot automatically open itself either. So what we suggest once a week, assigning somebody in your office who is an EDOC signer to come to the midterm packets under completed status. And here they're going to open the packets that they see listed. They're going to check it one more time to make sure everything looks good. And then they're going to come to the top of the page and select close packet. Now, as we were talking about earlier with month-to-month -month packets, you will very rarely need to manually close a packet. In fact, there's only two reasons that you should ever manually close a packet, and that is if it's month-to-month -month or if it's midterm. I tell my clients, think of it like your three M's. Manually close if month-to-month -month or midterm. The reason why we don't close any of our other packets manually, like move-ins or renewals, is because those packets are designed to close themselves when the entire process within one site has been completed. And your corporate team members have been trained to know what to look for if you guys are using best practice. And to show you kind of that same information, that giveaway is going to be down here in your packets snapshot. So what they're checking is if under deleted, how many packets are listed here? This number should be very low, if anything at all. And if you have deleted a packet, you should have good notes as to why you did delete that packet. Under closed pending, that means that you've closed a packet that has red X's still remaining within it. Again, if this number is high, your corporate team members will be looking in your activities tab to know whether or not it was a midterm or if it was a month to month packet. The number that should always be highest is going to be here under closed. And this is where all of your packets should end up flowing to on their own, again, with the exception of that midterm or of that month to month packet. All right, guys, so this does lead us to our final very short quiz, starting right now.
guys, we made it. You finished. Wow. Okay. Now, um, you know, when it comes to the midterm packet, it is a fully manual process. Um, you know, doesn't have the auto triggers like the, you know, other processes does. You control the entire packet. All right. When it comes to score, Mo has eight. I would like to award 10 points to the first person who answers this quiz, raises their hand at the end in 10 seconds. Okay, that'll be it. If you can do it in 10 seconds, here comes the quiz. All right, Nisha, even though it was in 20 seconds, we'll take it, okay? <laughs> nice job there. All right, guys, so let's see what kind of answers we came up with here on our midterm quiz, okay? Question number one, when will a midterm packet be created? When I create it, remember, like, okay, when it comes to the um, move-in packet, it has the auto trigger to create itself once a prospect becomes an applicant. With a renewal packet, it has the auto trigger to, to become a packet once a, a renewal offer has been generated. But when it comes to a midterm packet, it doesn't have any auto triggers. You control it. So it's when you create it. Question number two, can a midterm packet close itself? No, not at all. It's manual. So like Jennifer said, maybe once a week having a person, um, you know, go in and just close those packets out so that, you know, they can file themselves away. Question number three, what are the only two acceptable reasons to manually close a packet? And that's if it's a midterm packet or if it's a month to month, because the packet doesn't even work for a month to month. It doesn't even let you generate pages, okay? So if it's a midterm packet, close it. If it's a month to month, if the person tells you that they're gonna go month to month instead of signing a lease, close it, okay? All right, guys, and you have been a, a spectacular class. Thank you so much for being so active and you know chatting with me in the, in the Q&A box. I do have one more minute left of information, literally one minute. Um, and this is just to let you know how to get your packets turned on, okay? All right, let's generate some packets. Well done, guys, and congratulations. Your training is now complete. So what happens next? If you have been working with a real page packet consultant, they will be informed of your overall performance today. And once reviewed and approved, they will be able to activate your packets first thing tomorrow morning. From tomorrow's date, you will have 30 days to work with that consultant directly on any issues or revisions of those packets. So be sure to use that time wisely. If you do not have a packet consultant, 